What's up, Peak City? How we doing? Amazing, amazing. Hey, uh, as you're sitting down, if you're a family that went through parent dedication, come on up to the stage. We're going to go on stage this time. I know I brought you around. We're going to give it up. These are some families that have welcomed new kids into their family over the past couple years, and they're committing their parenting to God. So, man, can we give it up for these families? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Get on over here, man. Amazing. This is so cool. I, let me explain to you kind of what this is. All right, this is something new. If you've been around Peak City for a while, you're like, we, we've never done this before. This is, uh, what, what these families did on Wednesday night is they went through a parent dedication kind of class discussion. And we say parent dedication really more than baby dedication, right? Because they're dedicating their parenting to God. They're gonna try to raise these kids up to know and love and follow Jesus. It's a parent dedication. A baby dedication, I mean, come on, you can, you can say your baby's going to grow up and follow Jesus, but you don't know. Parents of teenagers in the room, can I get an amen? You don't know what the heck they're going to do, but no, you, you can. And so, man, we want to surround these families with love and encouragement as they go on this journey of, of parenthood. Um, our church is growing in young families. Uh, I know this because of math, all right? I asked one of our Peak City Kids nursery workers a couple weeks ago, I said, hey, uh, how many babies we got back there? And she was like, nine or 10, like per service. I'm like, okay, that's just a number. How, like, what was that like a year ago? And she was like, one, one per service. That's like 10 X the amount of new families that are starting to come here. And that's a beautiful thing. We should celebrate that. That's beautiful. And so we're always going to surround these families with love and encouragement. If you're a parent of teenagers, if you're a parent of grown kids that have gone on, when we pray for these families in just a second, if you've got grown kids and they're beyond, I want you to keep your eyes open during prayer, all right? Because I want you to pick out a family, and I want you to go meet them after service in the lobby. I want you to encourage them. I want you to invite them over for dinner. I want you to offer free child care, because y'all know what this phase is like. It's hard. And so we're always going to be a church that surrounds these young families and loves them and, and helps them do whatever it takes to raise these kids up to know Jesus. So right now, we're going to pray. I know I had you sit down, but can I have you stand back up as we pray for these families? All right, let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and let's pray for these families. Jesus, we love you, and we trust you with every family represented on this stage right now. God, we pray for every marriage on this stage. God, we pray that as they raise kids together, that the, the, the difficult challenge of raising kids in the 21st century would not pull them apart from each other, but they would actually drive them closer to one another. God, we pray for healthy, stable, loving marriages that these kids can learn from. God, we pray for these kids right now on the stage right now. We know that not everyone, we, we, God, we know there's people in the, in, in, in the congregation right now and watching online who have not been able to have kids. And God, we, we mourn with them and we, we want them to know that they are seen and we love them and you know their situation. And so God, I just stop right now even just to pray just for the families who are struggling with infertility right now in our congregation. We lift them up to you. We ask you to meet them. Meet them in that spot of loneliness, God. And God, help them to have a spirit to celebrate what we're celebrating on the stage right now. I know that's a hard moment to be in. And so God, we acknowledge that. But God, we pray for these kids right now on this stage. God, we pray that you would just use them, that you would grow them up to be world changers, raise them up to be future business leaders in our city, future people that are leading people to you, future pastors, future worship leaders. The, the church of tomorrow is on this stage right now. And so, God, we trust you with it. We know you're going to do big things with their lives. And we pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we celebrate these families? Y'all are good. You can go. You can go. Yeah. Beautiful families. All right, you can sit down. We're going to talk about sex now. <laughs> That was too easy. That's too easy of a segue, man. We just did like parent. We got babies on stage. I'm going to talk about the thing that makes those babies. Thank you, Joseph. You're the man. Oh, my gosh. God bless those families <laughs> and the sleepless nights ahead of you. <laughs> I feel the same way sometimes, man. I feel the same way. Man, I, I, I know that like some of you are like, man, that's weird. We've never done that in church. And you know, like we're not a very traditional church. We don't have many traditions around here, right? 
But I believe it should be a tradition of ours that we just always celebrate and lift up and care for young families. The next generation should always be something that holds a special place in our hearts, man. So we're going to keep doing that, all right? Um, if you have a Bible, go ahead and get to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, no sweat. We'll have the words on the screen for you. We are talking about sex. So I know some of y'all are like, man, this is my first time at Peak City. We're talking about sex. I came on Sex Sunday. Well, last Sunday was Sex Sunday too. So we're just talking about sex. And, and here's the thing, man. We said it last week. We have to talk about this. Right? The reason we're talking about sex in church is not just to be like shocking and, you know, draw a crowd, though it does draw a crowd. Had our largest non-holiday attendance in the history of our church last Sunday. You try to tell me sex don't sell. <laughs> but we have to talk about it, man. Like, like we said last week, you know, this is, this is the issue that the enemy is using to attack us. I believe that the enemy is using sex in our culture to destroy marriages, destroy young people, destroy singles. Man, it's just killing us. And so we got to talk about it. And so we're talking about sex according to Jesus, right? Not sex according to culture, not sex according to like your desires and your temptations, not sex according to you, sex according to Jesus. And, and so we said last week that sex according to Jesus, it's this really high, really elevated view of sex, right? It, it, it seems extreme, in comparison to our culture, that really when you look at it, sex according to Jesus is this. It's this very simple gift, right? The gifts. It's the gift that God gave us to strengthen marriages. And that's it. <laughs> that's it. That's the tweet. End of sentence. Anything outside of sex in the context of strengthening a marriage is going to hurt and damage your mind and your heart and your soul. It's going to leave you in a place of regrets, and, and I'm telling you, it's just, it's, it's so harmful to you, it's so devastating. But that's that elevated view of sex, right? And it seems extreme because of what our culture has taught us and what we've bought hook, line, and sinker. So like last week we left, and some of y'all were like, how in the world will I ever live by that? That seems unrealistic, <laughs> seems Amish. <laughs> and, and this week I told you what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how the earliest followers of Jesus lived this out. The practical principles they lived by in order to reorient their lives and discipline themselves to a place where they could live out sex according to Jesus. That's where we're going today. Uh, last week, my message was called The Gifts. This week is called The Sprint. The Sprint. Everybody say The Sprint. The Sprint. Us kinder, my, my family tree is not a fast family tree. We're a very slow, short, squatty bunch. The sprints. My boys are my boys are fast though. They might be my, my sons might be might, might be making a new family tree. They they got some speed on them. We'll see how the middle school and high school years treat them. The sprints. First Corinthians chapter six. We're going to read a passage from the Apostle Paul. If you're new to the Bible, Paul was the greatest missionary that's ever lived. Uh, you can take that verse down until I'm done talking about Paul. I don't want to get distracted on sex too quick. Paul was the greatest missionary the world has ever seen. Um, he was one of the greatest leaders of the early church. And he wrote letters to different churches. And so this is a letter, 1 Corinthians. It's the first letter he wrote to Christians in a city called Corinth. The Corinthian people lived in Corinth. First letter to Corinthians. That's why, I mean, I know sometimes in the Bible it's like, why do they even call these books certain names? That's it. So he's writing this letter, and he had to correct Christians all the time on how to live out sex according to Jesus. And so he writes some words, and y'all going to be like, man, these are, these are wild verses we're reading today. All right, usually you know, these are not the verses that you put on like a, a sunset pick. On Instagram, like these are not verses that are going to be your profile pic later today, but these are nitty gritty real life application passages that can guide us to live out sex according to Jesus, all right? First Corinthians chapter six, y'all ready? Whew. I'm telling you, I preached my guts out last service and I'm back on a full tank again for this one. I don't even care, man. We're going to go. First Corinthians six, here we go. <clears throat> He says this, I have the right to do anything. Notice that's in quotes. I have the right to do anything, meaning that was something that was being said in the culture. I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything you say, Paul says, but, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, in quotes again, here's another popular, popular cultural view. You say, food for the stomach and stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. Now pause for a second. Paul just referenced two cultural approaches to sex 
that were alive and well in the first century. And some of y'all try to tell me the Bible is old and outdated. Some of y'all try to tell me that the Bible is antiquated and it's got dust on it and has nothing to do with today. But my God, if you didn't tell me that that was written 2,000 years ago, I'd have thought you were talking about 21st century America. I can do whatever I want, they say. I can do anything I want to do. It's my body. Sound familiar? I can do whatever I want. It's my body. They're my urges. They're my temptations. It's my thoughts. It's my mind. I can, it's me. I can do whatever I want. 21st century America says, and so did 1st century ancient Near East. And Paul, Paul says, you know what? You know, what's funny is when, when he explains this, you'd expect him to say, you say I can do anything. You'd expect a good pastor to be like, no, you can't though. No, you can't. Uh-uh-uh. And he doesn't. <sighs> and religious people in the room have always squirmed about this. They're like, Petey, you, you better tell them they can't have sex. You better tell them they can't do that. Or else you're going, if you go soft on sin, I'm telling you, like this place is going to get, well, the country's going to go to ruins as if it already isn't in ruins. You better not be soft on sin, but, but wait up. Paul does not say you can't do anything. In fact, he actually almost agrees. You know, and, and this is the jaw-dropping truth of Christianity. We said it last week. I'll say it this week. I'll say it till the day I die. There is nothing you could ever do to make God stop loving you. You can do what ever you want <laughs> and he'll love you and he'll forgive you and he'll accept you and he will choose you there's nothing you could do to make God love you anymore there's nothing you do to make him love you any less his love is fixed when he stretched his arms out of the cross to die for you his love for you became a concrete statement you can't change it so yeah you can do anything <laughs> he says but not everything is beneficial Ooh, man see that's the heart of God God's not trying to get you to just live by some random list of rules. He's trying to get you to see like, yeah, you can do whatever you want, but man, I've got, I've got so much more for you. I've got so much more in store for you. Everything is permissible. Sure, what, do whatever you want. God's love is never changing, but not everything is beneficial. Hold on to that. Hold on to that. Then he goes, hey, you say cultural ideology, food for the stomach and stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. Again, come on, this ain't. This was written 2,000 years ago. You could have wrote this today and published on Twitter. What, what he's saying is the cultural idea was sex is like another appetite. It's just like your need for food, right? Like the body was made to eat food, and so you've got to eat like, you know, the food for the body, food for the stomach, the stomach for food, uh, sex for the body, the body for sex. It's just part of being human, right? Like we bought this idea. I mean, this, is, is, this is exactly what we have been fed today is that sex is just like eating, you got to eat, <laughs> right? And so there's healthier ways to eat, and there's unhealthy ways to eat. But either way, you got to eat. It's like sex. Sex is the same way according to our culture. You know, there's healthier ways to get your sexual needs met, and then there's unhealthy ways. But either way, you got to get it. you got to meet that need. It's just another appetite. And Paul says, actually, here's what you'd be better off doing. You'd be better off understanding and, and approaching your quest for healthy sexuality by understanding that you should actually master it. You should seek to conquer it. You should like go to war against your unhealthy sexuality. That it's like a battle. Right? He says you, you'd be better served to try to master it, to try to conquer it, to try to fight it. That it's a battle. See, what Paul's trying to get you to understand is that your quest for healthy sexuality, it will, like, you will not win that battle passively. Healthy, a healthy sex life, a healthy view of sex, healthy sexuality will not just happen. It's a battle. It ain't going to come to you like the junk mail comes to you. You ever notice nobody ever asks for junk mail? It just happens passively, Right? Some of y'all got in on cryptocurrency last year, and you're just passively making millions, and we all hate you. Ain't nothing better than passive income. Make money, don't work. He's trying to say, your quest for healthy sexuality will not come passively. It will not just happen to you. It is a battle. It's a fight. But here's the deal. Oh, man, it's not like the battle you're thinking of right now. 
It's not, it's, 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 it's not like the battle you're thinking of right now. See, when I say it's a battle, I know what you're thinking. I know you're thinking that I'm about to like rah-rah you. Rah-rah, preacher speak. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. In Christ you are more than a conqueror. If God is for us, who could be against us? God's calling you to run through a brick wall. You just got to start running and trust that he'll cut out a hole for you. You think I'm about to preach or speak you, right? Rah, 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 rah. The problem is it's not that kind of battle. <laughs> it's, this is not like a David and Goliath battle where you got to like pick up your five smooth stones to, con- to conquer the five sexual temptations of your life. <laughs> this ain't that kind of sermon. It's not that kind of battle. Look what, look, look, what, look what kind of battle this is in verse 18. Paul says like this. Here's the battle it is. Flee from sexual immorality. <laughs> Flee! Run! All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Paul says here's the kind of battle it is. It's the battle where the only way you win is to run! <laughs> you ain't gonna win. You can't stand, ta- you can't stand toe-to-toe here. You gotta, you gotta flee the normal word that we would use today. We don't say the word flee, we'd say the word sprint. You better sprint from sexual sin. I'm not talking like a light yog. I'm talking you run like you stole something. With every bit of energy you have so that when you get to the other side, you got nothing left. He says you better sprint from it. Because it's that kind of battle. You see, it's, it's, it's way more like the kind of battle like if, if you're ever out hiking and you come across a wild animal. That's the kind of battle this is. All right? Y- y- y'all see the video of the cougar chasing the guy on the trail a couple months ago? Go and play that for us. I want that video up. Yeah. You ready for this? This was in Utah, not very far from here. Oh, my gosh. Huh. That's, that just happened. This is why I don't go hiking. Hiking is just hard walking, and there's predators. Play it again for me. Play it again. I want one more time. This is like, this is real. Some of y'all live on the west side of I-25, and this is just like every Tuesday for you. You got bears in your front yard, and it's like, yeah, no big deal. I got a bear climbing in the front yard. You're an animal. These are predators that will kill you. Right? All right, you can take it down now. <laughs> That's the kind of battle it is. It's the battle where, like, you better just run. You better flee. You better sprint. And get the heck out of there. <laughs> because you can't do it. I know you didn't come to church today to, tell, to hear somebody tell you you can't do it, but you can't do it. You can't win this one. You are not strong enough to withstand the attacks of the devil on your life. You are not strong enough to withstand. Uh, you, you can't go toe to toe with this one. Your sinful nature and the attacks of our enemy and the culture we live in, you will lose. So Paul says the the battle is to sprint, to run as far as you can. I love how how the author of Proverbs 5 puts it. Proverbs 5, you can go ahead and pull up verse 1 for me. Yeah, stop there for a second. The author of Proverbs 5, he compares sexual sin and sexual immorality. He gives it it kind of a character so that we can like allegorically understand it. And the character is called the adulterous woman. I want you to hear what he says about it. It's so fascinating. He says this. He says, my son, pay attention to my wisdom. Turn your ear to my words of insight that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. Now, here it is. For the lips of the adulterous woman drip honey. they sweet. They came through dripping. Drip, drip. And her speech is smoother than oil. Whew. Sexual sin, sexual immorality will creep into your life smoother than oil. It, it, but before you know it, you will be taken down and addicted and your life will be ruined. It's smoother than oil. It seems like how could you ever resist it? How could you ever put up, put up a block against me? Come on now, it's, it's sweeter than honey. It's smoother than oil. Then he, check, then, he, then he writes this. But in the end, she's as bitter as gall Sharp as a double-edged sword. Oh my gosh, if you were a Sunday school kid, you better be jumping out your bones right now because I just said a phrase that should trigger all the alarms in your head. He says, sexual sin is as bitter as gall and as sharp as a double-edged sword. And if you were a Bible student, if you were a good little boy and girl in Sunday school, you know there's another phrase, there's another time in the Bible where it talks about something being sharp as a double-edged sword. The word of God, right? 
Paul writes in the, in, in the New Testament that the word of God, the Bible itself, is as sharp as a double-edged sword, meaning it's so powerful, it's so sharp, it'll pierce your heart and fillet you open and change you from the inside out. It'll pierce through every motive you've got. It'll pierce through every, every, every thought you've got. Oh my gosh, it's so sharp, it's so sharp, it's so powerful. The writer of Proverbs says, as powerful as the word of God is for good, let me tell you, sexual immorality is as sharp as a double-edged sword. And it'll fillet you open and it'll rip out your heart and destroy everything that you've ever held dear. And then he goes on. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I thought about staying here for the whole sermon and I couldn't, I couldn't. It says, her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life and her paths wander aimlessly, but she does not know it. Meaning sexual sin, it don't give a rip about you. Sexual immorality doesn't give a rip about your dreams. It doesn't give a rip about your marriage. It doesn't give a rip about your kids. It does not care about you. It does not regard your circumstances. It only knows death. It only knows destruction. It only knows to kill and destroy your life. And then he says this. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Here it is. Woo. It says, keep to a path far from her. Keep to a path where? Far. We got the right side over here doing good. Keep to a path where? Where? Far. I thought I said near. Keep to a path where? Far. Okay, far, far. I just want to make sure. Do not go near the door of her house. Don't go near the door of her house. Keep to a path far from her. My wife, uh, Brittany, ever since I've known her, she has always had like a side hobby. She's always known what's happening in the real estate market. All right, like every time I come downstairs and we're like vegging, hanging out, she's on her phone. She's like looking at Zillow. She, know, like she just knows the market. Always, ever since we've been together, she just knows the real estate market. It's never earned us a buck. It's only cost us bucks. But she always knows. She always knows the good houses are available with this house. And it's just like a side hobby for her, right? Well, a couple months ago, she said, hey, our dream house just hit the market. And I'm like, really? She's like, yeah, let's go drive by it. And that's not uncommon. It was some crazy fancy home. Like, my gosh, there's no way. Well, that's like mansion in heaven stuff. Like when God said, what kind of mansion you want? I'm like, I want that one. But like we drove by it. And, um, and it was kind of like out of the way on the way home, right? Like we were out getting groceries and it's like, hey, you want to go drive by that house and see? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're like, it wasn't like completely out of the way, but just a little bit. You had to take a few extra turns, go down a few roads and like, oh, there it was. And man, it was legit. It's like modern. Oh my God. It's like a, it's like a modern piece of art on a big old piece of land with a perfect view of the mountains. Whew. It's beautiful. We go home out the next day going to kids' basketball practice, on the way home. She's like, hey, you want to drive by the house again? I'm like, sure, let's go. <laughs> man, that'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Gosh, man, you never know. Hit, if we hit the lottery one day, you never know. Next night, out to dinner, coming back. Hey, you want, you want to drive by one more time? Shh, come on, let's go. Let's roll, girl. <laughs> and at some point I had to say, hey, we got to stop this. Because <laughs> I know us, we're going like, to end up on the news, pastor stalks neighborhood home. <laughs> Right? We're going to end up getting out, parking the car, and just like walking around the neighborhood like, I wonder what it would like to live in this neighborhood. I don't know. I wonder what it would be like. Then we're going to see them out. on the, Like the people who are selling the house still live there. I'm like, well, they're going to see us. We're going to try to make friends. We're going to try to convince them to sell it for half of its price. Like it's going to be a whole thing. It's going to be creepy. We got to stop. We got to stop. We're going too close. See, I believe what the author of Proverbs 5 is saying is that the reason that some of us can't even imagine conquering sexual sin in our lives the reason some of us can't even imagine living out sex according to Jesus is because we are not taking a path far from it. <laughs> We're rolling right up next to it. Wonder what that'd be like. And we go around for a little while. It's like, man, what would that be like? <sighs> We're running up so close. We're not on a path far. We're in the same cul-de-sac. And, and some of us are even closer than others. Some of us aren't even just on the, on, the, on the road beside it. Some of us are pulling up in the driveway. <laughs> some of us are up there rocking on the front porch, offering to help hang Christmas lights. We close. And we wonder why we can't imagine ever living without it. We wonder why we can't imagine conquering it. 
because we're right up next to it. And Paul says, if you ever want to beat this thing, if you ever want to conquer this, this attack of the enemy on your life, you better sprint. You better run as far as you can, man, and get away as fast as possible. You better, you better sprint away from pornography. You better not mess around with it. Did you know, did you know that you don't have to have Instagram or Twitter on your phone? There is no law. There is no regulation. You don't have to do it. You don't have to have the app on your phone that's a gateway to pornography. And you know that's what it is. Come on, you don't care that much about your friend's dogs or your friend's lunch. You're hanging out there because you, you know you're going to see something. It's the gateway. Did you know that uh, there's going to be this new information? Did you know that you don't have to have a smartphone? There's a thing. So anybody under the age of 30 won't know this, but there's a thing called a Motorola Razor. It's a flip phone. And it was a beautiful invention at one point. And I know some of you are like, man, you're sounding Amish right now. You're sounding like I'm supposed to reject all things modern. Well, I, I, I'm telling you, you better sprint away from it. And Jesus said that if your left hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. It's better to go to heaven with one eye and one hand than go to hell with both. You better take extreme action. You better sprint. You should sprint from that toxic relationship that you end up going back to every three months. If someone were to look at the schedule of your life, they'd see that you tell yourself, I'll never be back with that person again. I'll never go back. And then every three months, hey, what's up, girl? Hey, how are you? Hey, you want to go out? You wanna go? Okay. And then you tell yourself, I'll never do it again. Oh, my gosh. Sprint. Get as far away as you can. Run for the hills. You should sprint from that late night party that you know is going to land you drunk and doing things you never should have done. Sprint from that late night with your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Come on, you know nothing good happens after dark in a basement. It's either sex or murder. Somebody last ever said, or both. <laughs> I'm like, we got some people that live some life in this church. Any and all are welcome. You ought to sprint from it. You wonder why it's so hard to overcome, but you're like, foot's hanging off the edge. You ought to sprint from it. You ought to sprint from that emotional connection that you're developing with your coworker right now. You keep laughing at their jokes. They keep laughing at your jokes. You can't wait till they come to the meeting and see if you guys lock eyes and make that joke about your boss. And like the, most, the, the, the thing you're looking the most forward to in your day is just your interactions with that coworker. Let me tell you, that emotional connection that you are building, it is the bridge that you will cross at some points and have an affair and wreck your life. You ought to run. You ought to sprint. You ought to you ought to run like you stole something. You ought to run for your life. And you know that's what it is, right? <laughs> you know, that, like, you're, you're not just sprinting. You're not just running from something that grandma doesn't approve of. Like, I know some of y'all are living some life right now, and you're in some situations that you're really hoping that grandma don't find out at Thanksgiving in a couple weeks. Like, you are not just running from something. That God is going, well, you know, I wish they didn't, but it's 21st century. Times have changed. No, 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 no. You are running for your life. You are sprinting for your life. That's why Paul says, again, back up to verse 18. He says, flee from sexual immorality. All, all other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. When you don't sprint from sexual sin, you end up hurting yourself. You end up killing yourself. You end up killing your own dreams. You end up guaranteeing your future therapy bills. You're hurting yourself. You got to run. You got to sprint. You got to run for your life. Now, <clears throat> pause. Everyone take a big deep breath. <sighs> um, I could stop the message right there, and that'd be every sermon you've ever heard from the church, right? The church has been excellent 
at telling you what you shouldn't do. Come on, the church is known as like the place where you promote abstinence, right? Don't have sex outside the context of marriage. That's like the church, like we've been great the past 50 years at saying, don't do drugs and don't, do, don't, don't have sex. Don't do that, bad things. We've been great at that. What we've not been great at is not just telling people what they shouldn't do, but what they should do. And that's actually where the power is found. The power is found in not what you sprint from, but what you sprint to. Not what you shouldn't do, but what you should do. My, um, my, middle, my middle child, my youngest son, Solomon, I know if you were here last week, you're probably itching to know, how did your boys do in basketball yesterday? And answer is, they cleaned house. And I was that proud redneck dad the whole time. Keith and Carrie even made me a shirt that says, that said, he can go left. And I wore it loud and proud yesterday. My youngest boy, Solomon, though, he's first grade. He didn't know what he's doing. And, like, if you've ever watched first graders, like, Jay and Jay in the back, Jay coaches them. It's like, the kids, it's amazing. They leave the game, and they're not sweating. They're not tired. But every parent is like, we need a stiff drink. I talked to 10 parents yesterday. 10 for 10 said that they took blood pressure meds before they came. <laughs> They're all sweating. And the whole time, I mean, the whole game is just parents yelling at their kids what not to do. Don't, don't do that. No, no, no. Don't shoot on that goal. That's the wrong goal. Don't do that. No, don't pick up the ball and just walk. You don't, don't, you got to, you got to dribble. No, 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 don't do that. Don't put your hands in your pockets on the court. It's a game involving hands. Don't put your arms in the jersey and walk around like a mummy. You need hands and arms. It's a physical game. Don't do that. Don't, 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 don't. We spent an hour yelling at kids about what they shouldn't do. But you know what I found out is that the kids that are excelling at that age group, it's not even that they're good at basketball. It's just that their parents have told them not just what they shouldn't do, but what they should do. Like we got a little boy on our team named Teddy. Teddy's got a mullet. Business in the front, buckets in the back. This kid dominates. And the reason he dominates is that his dad told him, go get the ball. That's it. Wherever it is, go get it. When they throw a pass, go intercept it. When that ball's loose, go dive for it. The ball is yours. Go get it. And little Teddy gets out there and just mops the floor up with these little kids. Because he knows what he should do. See, the power for the earliest followers of Jesus was not just found in what they shouldn't do. The church had been saying that for years. The church had been saying what you shouldn't do, and look where we've where, where we landed ourselves. We're still struggling with the same old junk. We're still, we're still messed up. It's not helping us because we're not talking about what we should do. And that's where Paul would instruct them on what they should sprint to. All right? There's two things he says to sprint to. One of them specifically for married couples, and the other one is an all skate for everyone. Everyone sprints to the second part. Okay, So let me, let me take you there. Flip over the next chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Here's what Paul says. Paul says, now, <clears throat> for the matters you wrote about, here's again a quote. Here's what people are saying. It is good for a man to not have sexual relations with a woman. Someone saying, hey, we're Christian. We're holy. The holy thing is to deny yourself. Right? masochistically following Jesus, like it's a spiritual discipline or something to not have sex when you're married. He says, but since sexual immorality is occurring, <laughs> FYI, since y'all are messed up, here's what we're going to do. Each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body but yields it to her husband in the same way The husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other, except for for, do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent, and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Y'all trying to act like the Bible ain't applicable today. Now, now he's saying, hold up, get your mind out of the gutter. Lift your mind up out of the gutter, because I know what you're thinking right now. I know some of you dudes are like, I just got my new one-liner. I'm going to drop it on my wife tonight. I'm going to be like, baby, the Bible said you have authority over my body. I will, I will yield whenever you want. I, I will not withhold, I suppose. The Bible says. Can't do anything about it. 
I know what you're thinking. On that note, though, it's important for us to address the fact that that verse, for if you're here and you're skeptical of faith, if you're skeptical of the church and of all of this, you need to understand the Bible gets labeled as a, an ancient dated book that is not uh, relevant, that it's regressive. But you need to understand that verse that we just read that I just joked about was a jaw-dropping progressive verse when it was written. He said, women, you don't have authority over your own bodies. Wives, you don't have authority over your own bodies. You yield it to your husbands. Everybody knew that. This is a culture that devalued women. This is a culture that said women have no rights, no authority, can't speak up. No, no, no. They knew that. That's common. Then he said, also, husbands, you have no authority over your body. You yield it to your wife. Meaning women, you actually have authority in this. You have power in this. The, the, the Bible is actually giving voice to women when, when, when women were completely voiceless. So don't believe the hype. Don't believe the press that the Bible is this regressive, outdated, antiquated book that has nothing to do with it. Come on now. The Bible is so ahead of its time on its views of women. So ahead of its time. But we got to back up and see what Paul's doing. Because Paul says, here's the deal. Married folks in the room, you ought to sprint from sexual sin and you ought to sprint to your spouse. You ought to sprint from sexual sin, run as fast as you can away and as equally fast as you run from that, you should run to your spouse. That a good, healthy marriage should have a good, healthy sex life. Some of y'all are like, man, I need to be tithing more because this man's saying things I've been wanting the church to say for years. Peakcityco.com slash give. <laughs> we'll extend the series to third week. <laughs> I'm kidding. Kind of kidding, kind of not. You ought to sprint to your spouse. A good, healthy marriage ought to have a good, healthy sex life. And let me tell you, I, I've counseled couples for 15 years, and the common thread I hear in marriages, even Christian marriages, sometimes especially Christian marriages, is that it's a sexless marriage. And you need to know that if that's the case, you are opening the door of the enemy to attack your marriage. It's not my words, that's what Paul says. Paul says you should come together so that the enemy does not tempt you and distract you. Like, you you got to run to your spouse. Your spouse, hear this, and I know, guys, I know this is so sensitive. I know this is so, such a weird thing to talk about in church, but that's the kind of church we're going to be, right? That talks about things that matter, that actually impact our lives, and this really matters and actually impacts our lives. I know this is hard to talk about. I know, I know, I know. And I know that for many of you, the reason your sex life is so complicated is so multi-layered, right? When you, when you talk about abuse and past trauma, and past regrets, and current relational trauma, and current relational issues, and like, I, I know, I know, I know, I know it is multi, that's why I'm not pretending to put an easy band-aid on this. I'm just saying, if you are struggling in your sex life with your spouse, you gotta, you gotta figure out how to get help, counseling, therapy, let, let one of our pastors talk with you and meet with you, like, just however it needs to happen, like, the, 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 the common piece of advice I give to newlyweds that I marry, in premarital counseling, and then when they get married, I say to them, I know it's going to sound weird, but you should have a regularly scheduled conversation with your spouse about your sex life. Put it in the calendar. And I know it sounds weird because like, oh my gosh, I thought we were just supposed to talk about it when it feels right and when we're both in the mood. Come on, man. Life happens. And if you're not talking about it, I'm telling you, the enemy will get in there and he will create discontent. He will create bitterness and he will divide your marriage. You got to talk about it. You got to get help. It's so important. Your spouse, your spouse should be the person you confide in, that you love more than anything, that you trust with your deepest secrets, that you trust with your, your biggest dreams. Your spouse should be the one that you run to. Your spouse should be the one that you have sex with so that you don't end up stepping outside the bounds of that. This is what Paul is saying. I know it's not popular to say today. I know, I know, I know. I know the church has messed this up for years. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And the Bible says... Come together so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. You got to run to your spouse. Now, that's for the married folk. That's for you guys to go chew on and talk about, figure out. We're probably going to have a bigger baby dedication in 10 months. 
But there's another one, there's another one, there's, there's, there's a bigger one. There's a bigger one that both married people and single people were sprinting to. There's a bigger thing that Paul, in his teachings in the New Testament, I'm going to show you one verse, but he does it consistently throughout the New Testament. There's a bigger thing that the Jesus followers sprinted to when they were sprinting from sexual sin, all right? Check this out, verse 36. I'm sorry, verse 32. Verse 32, it says this. Oh, man, this is a confusing one. Jesus, we need you to help us understand this. Jesus, we need you, God, help me to say it clearly. God, help people that are listening right now, both online and in person, God, open their eyes and their minds and their hearts. God, we need you to help us understand this because I believe right here, Jesus, is where you want us to unlock the key to overcoming this. So God, we just, we need you here. Verse 32, it says this. It says, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. A single man, a single man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An, an, an unmarried woman or a virgin, a single woman, is, considered, is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirits. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband and her interests are divided. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Now, confusing verse, here's what he's saying. Single people, and this is a beautiful passage. If you're single in the room and you've ever felt relegated to the sidelines in a church like this because you're not married, you don't have kids, you don't fit the you know, married 2.5 kids, a dog and a white picket fence. If you've ever felt like that, what Paul is saying here and what Jesus would affirm is that if you can stay single, it's actually better to. If you can stay single, you can actually, you live with an undivided calling. You live with an undivided calling of what God wants you to do. Love God, love people, build his church, and you can focus everything you have on it. But then he says, if you're, if you're married, here's the deal. You're, it's, it's not that you're lesser than, but you have to understand that your, your calling is, is divided. You have a calling to love God, love people, and build the church, and you have a calling to build your marriage. And so your interests are a little bit divided. That's okay for us to say. right? And this is, again, this is the consistent teaching of the New Testament. If you can stay single, it's better to. If you're married, you got to understand your calling is divided. You're going to love God, love people, build the church, build your marriage. Single people, love God, love people, build the church. What he's trying to say is married or single, no matter where you are, the key to conquering this is that you ought to run, sprint from sexual sin, and you ought to sprint to your purpose. You sprint to the thing that God created you to do. The reason that the earliest followers of Jesus were able to master the desires of their flesh in the midst of a sex-crazed world was because they exhausted themselves loving God, loving people, and building the church. They didn't have enough energy at the end of the day <laughs> to worry about sexual sin because they were so focused on loving God, loving people, and building the church. Loving God, loving people, and building the church. And they poured themselves into it. And they sprinted from sexual sin, and they sprinted to the thing that they were created for. See, the devil's trying to get you caught up in sexual temptation, not by just putting images on your phone and making porn easy to access and giving you a coworker that you're interested in. No, no, no. The real way he's trying to get you involved in sexual sin is by robbing you of your purpose. When you have nothing to live for, you start living for the lower level desires of your flesh. When you have nothing, when you have no grand purpose in your life, you will listen to the dumbest voices in your head because what do you got to lose? Life is meaningless. It's purposeless. You got to sprint to your purpose. And, and man, I know, like Brittany and I, I'm telling you, we have, we have not done everything perfect. We've done a lot of things wrong, right? Mostly me. All me. But one thing we did right, and we still do right, is that we sprint to our purpose. Our relationship was built on purpose. We started dating, I mean, come on, this, this ain't the most like, typical church kid. I came to Jesus and a year later, we were getting ready to go into college, we went on a mission trip with our church and we weren't dating. We went to Northern Ireland and served these kids in poverty and told them about Jesus. And wouldn't you know, in the midst of serving our purpose, if your boy didn't reach his hand across the the seat of that airplane on the way home, the way back across the pond, and held the hand of Brittany Bernal. Woo! And thus it began. It's purpose. 
See, that, that's how it works. When you focus on your purpose, it's, it's amazing how life actually just starts to fall in place. This is why I tell single people all the time, when, when, when young adults, when single people say, how do I find the one? There is no the one, we've said that multiple times, but if you wanna know how to find someone that could be your spouse, here's what you do. And, and, and I stole this from a preacher a long time ago, I've been using it ever since, I, I don't take credit, this is not me, this is somebody else. Here's what you do, you put your head down and focus on your purpose. <sighs> love God, love people, build the church. Love God, love people, build the church. Love God, love people, build the church. You focus on your purpose. And then occasionally you lift your head up and you look around. You see anybody cute? No? Put your head back down. Love God, love people, build the church. Love God, love people, build the church. Love God, love people, build the church. Occasionally, lift your head up, look around. You see anybody cute? You do? Get her number. A relationship that's built on purpose will far outlast a relationship that's built on lust. You need, a, you need a bigger reason to live. You ought to sprint from sexual sin and sprint to your purpose. That's why Je like Jesus died for you. You need to understand, Jesus stretched his arms out on a cross so that you would live for more than the low level urges and temptations. So you live for more than what the stupid culture around us keeps feeding you. That's why Paul says, if you back up in 1 Corinthians 6, he says this, he says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you've received from God, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. He said, here's the deal, man. Jesus stretched his arms out on the cross and then he resurrected from the grave. And then he gave us his spirit to live inside of you. In the Old Testament, God's spirit dwelt in a temple. In the New Testament, he says, I'm gonna take my spirit, I'm gonna put it inside you. You are my temple. So that every, every room you walk into, you've got purpose. Every classroom you walk into, you, you carry the spirit of God with you love and joy and hope and peace, the things our world is bankrupt of. You're the one that, that brings it in and ushers it into the world. Every, every time you walk home, you, you, you get in your driveway, you, you walk into, into the doors of your home, you see your, your spouse and your kids, you've got purpose. You were created to live for so much more. So do it. Stop, stop, stop letting the enemy convince you that you're this basic human being with these basic needs, that you're just like an animal. Man, God died for you. He, he, he gave everything for you so that you would live for so much more. And I think that maybe some of you today need to step into that. Some of you for the very first time need to say yes to following Jesus. And we'll give you the chance to do that. You don't have to have your life cleaned up. You don't have to have the Bible memorized or none of that. And some of you need to commit your steps to God. You've already, you're already following Jesus, but you know you've been living for the low level desires of your flesh and you just need to step back into your purpose. And, and, you, and can I just reset us for a second on that church? When I do these, and we do them, if you're new here, we do this at the end of every service, every single week, because we never believe that God's word should be preached and we don't respond. And you need to know that that first decision, if it's your first time and you wanna give your life to Jesus, every week someone raises their hand and says yes. And that's a monumental decision. All right, we're gonna have baptisms here on December 5th, and we'll celebrate all those people that are giving their lives to Jesus. But when I get to that second decision, some of y'all are like, okay, so that's, that's the decision where if you're a Christian, but you're really messed up, you raise your hand. No, you need to know that when I say, hey, if you wanna recommit your life to Jesus, if you wanna commit your steps to him, if you wanna take this message and actually start living it out and commit that to Jesus, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three, one, two, three. I always put my hand in the air because I'm doing it. I'm committing my steps to Jesus. That's an all skate decision. That's a decision where if you, if you want Monday to Sunday of this week to be committed to following Jesus, you, you raise your hand. This is not, we don't audit this stuff, guys. We're participating. God's alive and active. He's doing something right now. And so I want you to stand up with me to your feet. And we're gonna respond to God today. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes. It's a private moment between you and him. And if you know that you've been searching for answers and you had no idea that this would be the place you found it, but that you wanna start following Jesus, you don't have to have your life cleaned up. You don't have to have the Bible memorized. You just have to be ready to say yes to Jesus. Yes to his love and his grace 
and his purpose for your life. And if you want to start following him and make that first time decision today to become a follower of Jesus, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Amazing. Amazing. You can put your hand down. If you know that, you know, you've been following Jesus, but you know that you've been letting the devil rob you of your purpose, and so you've been giving in to all kinds of low-level, lower self-thoughts, and your sinful nature is just running rampant in your life, but you know that today Jesus is calling you to get back on track with him, to step back into your purpose of loving God, loving people, and building his church, and you want to commit your steps to him. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Amazing, amazing. You can put your hand down. Beautiful. Let's pray together and then let's celebrate Jesus. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we thank you for showing up in this room today. We don't take it for granted. It's special what you just did in here. It's special the hands that just went up on both decisions, Jesus. That's, we don't take that for granted. We celebrate it. And Jesus, I pray right now for the people listening to this who are scared and nervous to have a conversation. They're scared and nervous to allow you to step into this area of their life and begin to heal. God, I pray that you give them courage. Jesus, we sang a song earlier that says, just the mention of your name brings healing. And so right now, we just... We just say, thank you, Jesus. If you're comfortable saying, thank you, Jesus, say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We don't have to heal ourselves. We don't have to mend our wounds ourselves. You're right here. So God, I pray courage for those people that need to have some conversations, need to take some hard steps. But God, I know you're gonna meet us there. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in the lives of so many in this room that you have given us what it takes to conquer to master this area of our lives. You've given us what we need to live for something greater. And that's why we sing, Jesus. That's why we, we worship you. Because we've found hope nowhere else but here. The world has offered us no help, but yet we found it in you. And so we trust you, Jesus. We give you our, our lives. We give you our sexuality. We give you our minds. And we ask you to transform us, Jesus. Transform us. Just the mention of your name. Just the mention of your name does something special. God, I pray right now you would help the enemy. Or you'd keep the enemy out. You would help us to take back ground that the enemy has taken from us. I see you taking ground. Oh, that's a song to sing right there. Oh, man, that's it. Your power is dangerous in the enemy's hands. God, we believe that and we sing that. Come on, man, do you believe that Jesus has the power to overcome this in your life? If you believe it, man, will you shout and will you sing and will you clap? Will you go nuts and celebrate Jesus? Come on, man, let's go. Let's go, man. Come on, it's better than that.